And that's really terrific. Okay, we're uh, wrapping up, and today we deal with the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are some slides on here. There's information that I have added uh, in this. You should have picked up an addendum that on Josephus at the table. I am ending with that, and I'm coming to that. That is not any part of those notes. Uh, I got talking and sharing a lot about Josephus and their questions that uh, talked about the history out of the book, and so I just decided well, there's, there's a, that I missed something, so I dropped something in on Josephus for you to take home. The Dead Sea Scrolls are very familiar to most people. They were found in caves uh, on the northern west portion of the Dead Sea in Israel. Um, there were many different caves, um, and they numbered each one of them, and then, of course, they did inventory as they would pull things out. They are still looking. Excavation still goes on in those areas. I don't know if they've found anything recently. I have not heard that. But they, have their st they still have their hands full digging and deciphering and translating and putting things together. It's, it's an ongoing thing at this point. So um, the Dead Sea Scrolls really brought to life a lot of of information, a lot of biblical things, and a lot of biblical proof. In Qumran, uh, which was uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, outside there, there was a city where the Essenes lived, and these back, they date back into the time of Christ. These were the keepers. These were the people that translated, or not translated, but copied scripture after scripture after scripture and on scrolls, rolled them, and they felt that God had called them to be preservers. I'm coming back to them in another area in another day. And we'll be looking at the Essenes uh, then. And there's some more information on them today. Um, I had the privilege of being here, there uh, in the 1970s. And it's right along, of course, the Dead Sea. And you can walk through the city. You can see, uh, you can see the caves, but you're not allowed to go up to them. No, no tourists can go hide in one and go looking. There they are. It was just a matter of walking a little and turning around and walking up a little mound. You could take some shots of some of the caves that were there. The Dead Sea Scrolls date between 400 before Christ. Where's that start? What's that line up with? Think about it a minute. That's when the inner that's right. That's when the intertestament period starts. Malachi is still roughly alive and writing his book, and it's dated 397. But he will die shortly thereafter. And the last biblical person that we know is gone. And yet these guys are already starting to preserve, like God's called them together to start preserving and copying. The, the act, somebody had the actual scrolls that, that God gave to copy them out. Now, I don't know that it was the Essenes. I would say it's a good chance. The Essenes were the caretakers in, in the end and put them in caves because the, of Roman rule and the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. General Titus, there was a big revolt for independence. And remember what I told you, Israel was fine as long as they just, did, they just blended in. But as soon as they rose their head and their stubborn head of saying, we want our nation back, then Rome is hard and harsh and fatal. And so Titus came and literally destroyed the city, destroyed the temple, uh, left no rock. Jesus had made in his life, he said, this temple is going to get destroyed and there won't be one rock on top of another. And when Titus destroyed the temple, there was not one rock left on top of another. The Roman soldiers came by and the gold that had been used on the top and in the inlays and everything, they took one stone at a time and peeled the gold off of it and threw the rock over the hill one at a time. Not one, one of these stones will be lit on top of each other. Wow, what a prophecy to come true 45 years uh, into the future. Content of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Old Testament books of the Bible are there. 
a lot of history of the times in which the scroll was written. They may find a scroll or a fragment, then they'll find also some history of, of that time, and the, the Essenes at that time would write like a, like a journal. They would find things like that. There were eight to 900 texts, over 50,000 fragments of different texts, which is just utterly amazing. Can you see why they still are working on them? I mean, they only found them, what, in the late 40s? 47. 47. So we're uh, 70, couple years, 72 years beyond that. The scrolls can be divided. We would divide them into two categories, those that are biblical and those that aren't. Fragments of every book of the Old Testament have been discovered except for the book of Esther. They have not uncovered anything from that. That in itself to me is incredible. It's fascinating. See what happened. The Essenes were the caretakers. Titus was destroying the city and they felt we've got to hide these because the, the, the war route's going to come up our way as he goes north again. And if he finds us here, we're in his way, nothing's stopping him. We need to hide God's word. And then they all fled to a fortress called Masada. And it was true, the Romans took, and it took them a while to take that fortress. But the Essenes, the last of the Essenes were up there. They went up for safety, but the Dead Sea Scrolls were already hidden and buried. There are now have been identified among the scrolls 19 copies of the book of Isaiah, 25 copies of Deuteronomy, and 30 of the Psalms. Prophecies by Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel that are not in the Bible but are found in the Apocrypha were not written, they're not, they were, did not follow in those biblical books, but it would say the rest of the book of Ezekiel or a prophecy of Jeremiah, and they were just found scrolls on them. I don't, don't ask me, well, what did they say, and are they going to come to pass, or they like anything said, but they have become part of the Apocrypha. If you go and find these guys, you'll see there's Apocryphal books that are on notations on them or something that they did. The Isaiah scroll found relatively intact. They just rolled it out. It's a thousand years older than any previously known copy of Isaiah. In fact, the scrolls themselves are the oldest group of Old Testament manuscripts ever found. They're not finding anything on any of the books any, that date back any further. So the, the Dead Sea Scrolls are incredible. Think about this a minute. While Jesus was walking the earth, these people were in, in Qumran, living an isolated life, copying scripture. Jesus had an encounter, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. Um, there are non-biblical writings along the order of commentaries on the Old Testament, paraphrases that expand the law, rule books of the community. How did people live in a community? War conduct. If Israel went to war, or there were some strategies they'd wrote, write about it. Thanksgiving psalms, hymns, add music, benedictions, liturgical tests, wisdom writings. Just somebody wrote down wisdom. Sorry, the Dead Sea Scrolls were most likely written and copied by the Essenes during the period from 200 to 68 A.D. after Christ. The Essenes are mentioned by Josephus and a few other sources, but not in the New Testament. That's the reference that I pulled that from a reference. That's not me speaking. I put an asterisk to that. I think that Josephus did make reference to the Essenes because he has a section of John the Baptist. And let me ask you something. The Essenes were dressed in camel hair. They ate locusts. They loved honey. They were recluses. They were voices in the wilderness, they called themselves. Now, you tell me who that starts to describe a little bit. John the Baptist was perfect. And John the Baptist, where did Jesus go to be baptized? You will find the Jordan River and probably where right above, only a few miles away where Qumran was. 
And, it, and we have nothing in reference that John the Baptist was a copier of the scriptures. I would like to think that scriptures tells us in the New Testament that John was a proclaimer and the paver of the way for the Messiah. But you know, he had to have somewhere to sleep. He had to have community. He had to have people. And I think that he would just retreat back to Qumran to have times of prayer and to be among God's people there that were on a mission in preserving God's word and scripture. So I think that that's probably, that's me. Okay, let's just leave it at that. That's me and I, I get good, I'm good on hunches. Okay, the Essenes were, the, who are the Essenes? They were strict Torah observant. Messianic, apocalyptic, that means they believed in the future, that God's prophecies were going to come true. They were Baptistic in that they baptized by immersion. Whoa. Are, that, are these the first Baptists then? Well, John the Baptist, might, he was called the baptizer, that might not be too far off. Although people say, well, the Baptists came out of the Anabaptists and out of the dark ages and that, uh, okay, uh, that, if you want to go that direction, that's fine. But uh, anyway, let's go. They were led by a priest they called the teacher of righteousness who was op opposed and possibly killed, and this comes out of the Dead Sea Scrolls in their writings, possibly killed by the establishment priesthood of Jerusalem. They didn't like, see, the, the political religious heads out of Jerusalem, out of the temple, would come out. Remember, John was baptizing, and who got sent out? They came right, right from the high priest, come out and say, who are you? What are you doing? What authority do you have to do this? It was the Pharisees and the, and the, 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 the sects and the Sadducees came to question John the Baptist. And they watched. Later on, they questioned Jesus out in the wilderness. Why? What right do you have to do these things? So they knew where they were. They knew where John the Baptist was. They knew where Qumran, Qumran was. They knew what they were doing. Although the Qumran community existed during the time of the ministry of Jesus, none of the scrolls refer to him. They don't. Nor do they mention any of his followers described in the New Testament. Then they don't. The enemies of the Qumran community okay, were called the sons of darkness, and they called themselves the sons of light. So if you lived in Qumran, these people knew the Lord, believed in the Messiah. Okay, I'm just going to say that right now. They knew, they trusted the Messiah, but they were Messianic Jews. They were Jews that believed in the coming Messiah. Who was John the Baptist? He was a Jew, and John the Baptist really, in our dialogue, would be a Messianic Jew. When Christ showed up, he believed. And said, this is the son of God. This is incredible. Amen. Follow him. I know who he is. This is incredible. Yes. Do you or do you not think that his mother received him by what has happened to her in marriage? Oh, I think so. I have no reference of that. Yeah, I think John the Baptist's mom would have taught him a lot and told him, what, yes, definitely. Okay, let's read on, though. They called themselves the Son of Light. They, they also called themselves the poor and members of the way. And way was capitalized. They thought of themselves as the holy ones who lived the house of holiness because the Holy Spirit dwelt in them. They already knew that they, somewhere along the line they picked up that the Holy Spirit dwelt and dwelt them. I don't know how, where. But this is in their writings. This is incredible. This, did, this, is, this is coming out of the scrolls. Now, look at this. Let's go to the Bible. You are the children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. They, Qumran, that lived there, they called themselves, the, the unbelievers, those that didn't know, sons of darkness, they called themselves the son or the children of light. And Paul's using that. Listen to this. And ask him for letters, this is Paul, to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any, this is Paul talking to the to temple and saying, give me do, official documents, I, I'm killing Christians, I'm dragging, I'm going for them, city to city. This is unsaved Paul. He gets saved real quick. We're in chapter 9. A few verses later, he's struck down on the road to 
So he's on his way so that, and look what, how, what he says, scripture says, so that if he found any belonging to the what? He was out after Christians. And they, the early church, what are you going to call them? They weren't, this wasn't First Baptist Church Jerusalem. It wasn't. It wasn't the Church of God or the Methodist Church or any of that stuff. But they started saying they're following the way. Now let me give you the overall tie-up. This gets exciting. Jesus, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the, and the light. Amen. Jesus said in John, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of light. Qumran was a reflection of, uh, was a small picture of what Israel should have been. The light of the world for Jesus, for God. And it is true. People that do not know the Lord today are in darkness. We who have had the privilege of finding Jesus Christ as Savior are children of light. We are in the light. I persecuted this way, he says, in giving testimony. Three years after he was saved, Acts 22, to, I did this to them. And that's what he called them. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil the way before the congregation, he withdrew for them, took his disciples. And there were people bad-mouthing the early church, the people of God, that they were known as the way. They were way followers, followers of Jesus Christ. If you go to Israel today, you will find it's just called the Shrine of the, of the Book. It is where the Dead Sea Scrolls are housed. Imitations are put on display that make you think they look real. There are real ones on display. Um, as you go, we are sort of up on top. We're on the roof. I'll just use that word. Because below us is where the museum is, several floors deep. And on the very top, you will see to the far right, that is like a cap, that is a, is a copy, a giant copy of the top that would have sealed the jars that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in. So that's the lid. To the far left is just a blank black wall. It is symbolic because they built this with simply this. The white on the right with the scrolls has the word of God and other things in it to show people the way to Jesus. It is white to represent light. The black wall represents the children of darkness. A blank slate. They have no basis. They have no following. It's just a blank thing. There's nothing on it. Now, do you see how it swirls to the top? Okay, you're coming down into the jars, what you're doing. And on the dead center is, is, the big, is the, one of the Isaiah scrolls. It, when I was there, I said, man, this is cool. It's the real thing. And it's under glass and everything, but I was told it is, was not that day, that it's in the back, it's preserved. And uh, maybe sometimes they, and all around here, and do you see a second floor to the left of the stairs? Look at the light down there. There's another window for display. And so you can go around, there's little people, to, there's not, there are people in areas to talk and share stuff. There are no little people, unless you're taller than they are, I guess. <laughs> Those are cool shoes. I need a pair like that. <laughs> and do you see sort of the handle of the Jewish scroll? The priests would have the handles. That's what that represents. There's a lot of symbol. You get that if you go there or you read up on it. There's a close-up. One of the most curious scrolls is the copper scroll. It was discovered in Cave 3. The scroll records a list of 64 underground, this is not in the Bible, underground hiding places throughout the land of Israel. The deposits are to contain gold, silver, aromatics, and manuscripts. These are believed to be treasures from the temple at Jerusalem that were hidden away for safekeeping. Ah, I love treasure hunts. By the way, the famous hit of fibs, Dr. I Want to Be a Schmidlap, <laughs> is forming an archaeological treasure hunt team for the summer of 2019. You can see him after class if you want to sign up and go treasure hunting in Israel. 
Some of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually appeared for sale on June 1st and 54 in the Wall Street Journal. And the advertisement read, the four Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical manuscripts dating back at least 200 B.C. are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an education or religious institution by an individual or group. Box F206 is who to contact. The next day the ad was gone. All responses to that address were grabbed. Never, and I don't know that they found the person that was putting that out that supposedly had them, but they should not have had Dead Sea Scrolls. They did not, but I can't help but think some probably did get out. But how do you authenticate once you leave, once they go out to a second party and they've been snitched, you can't authenticate them that they were in that cave any longer because now you're playing telephone. Well, he said that and she said that and he said that and something. But that's a big difference saying, I pulled these all out of there. Look, they're on me and you go back and you can get more. And they'll have the same dust on them and everything else. Here's some of the stuff that was in there. You can find this online. Just type Dead Sea Scrolls chart of finds or something like that. What caught my attention, Debbie, if you could use your red, look at the New Testament down at the bottom. There are about 5,700 fragments there. Notice there's stuff on Caesar and Plato wrote stuff about Plato. Some of his writings, they were preserving culture. And I said that up front. So they were historians, but they were biblical, biblicists first to share and keep God's word. If you want further study, I put three things on here. And I'm, I'm going to, why, if you jot them down if you quickly, or, I don't think they're in your notes, are they? Correct? They're not there. Okay, you can Google this and you can find other cool stuff. You can find better stuff than perhaps I have in great pictures, info. There's all sorts of things there. I want to I wanna go past the Septuagint very quickly because we already dealt with it, but it is in a dynamic, dynamic book in this time zone. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Alexander the Great had conquered the world, and one of the, reason, one of the things he said upon conquering was that I want, in Ale I want to set up Alexandria as a cultural the world cultural headquarters, where we have one copy of everything in the world. Then he died. And it took two generals later, or two generations later, the general that took over, it was his son of that area that continued this and actually did all of the building of, of uh, the libraries of Alexandria. And it was there that he gathered 72 Jewish scholars. He was gathering scholars from all over the world to do different things. He had a whole museum of just music, a whole museum of just poetry, uh, philosophers. But he had, he had one for the Word of God. And he pulled in out of Jerusalem 72 scholars to translate the Old Testament into Greek. It took 39 years to do it, but that's where we got our, the Greek New Testament the one when I was in Bible college, the one I studied for three years, and took Greek for three years. Um, that's, uh, we were using that as a result of it. When the Greeks ruled, they made speaking Greek the language of the day, so it was the reading language of the day. And what, what the Greeks didn't know, that God was at hand, making them do that and paving the way for God's people on the day of Pentecost to be saved and then scattered into all the parts of the earth because now they have the Word of God written in Greek and can share that with Greek-speaking people throughout the world. And the Apostle Paul did just that, and all the dis apostles, the disciples, the people saved, the next round of Christians, the early church fathers beyond that, in Greek they went. The Romans built the roads for them to make, and had the travel systems and the interstates done, and it was perfect to share the gospel around the world. Boy, what opportunity we have today with our interstate system, with our technology that we have, with our big mouth. 
And we all have big mouths at one time or another. With a mouth that we can proclaim and we can share Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. I need to get going here. Josephus. Let me just tell you what's in Josephus. I've mentioned to, uh, to, to you a lot. Went to the library today and said, do, do we have a copy of this in our church library? And they do not have one. I know Pastor Tim does, and I have one sitting around somewhere. Uh, you can find these in any library. Uh, you can go get them in a bookstore. It's a book. And in this, what you need to know is his name is Flavius Josephus. He lived roughly around 37 to 100 after Christ. So he did not live during the time of Jesus. Right after, he would have heard about it. But he was not there. He was Roman, but he was Jewish. He was a Roman Jewish historian. He embraced Rome. He embraced the Greek culture but he was a Jew. So that Jewishness at heart is going to come out in his writings, but so is the other stuff. This is not scripture. This is history. Flavius Josephus was a Jewish historian. He actually was a commander of Jewish forces up in Galilee. He was a general for a while. Later he became a Roman citizen. He was employed as a historian by the Flavian emperors, Vespasian, Titus, Domitian. Okay, who are the Flavian empires, emperors, you say? That's sort of their big overall family name. They are all sort of related. Okay, that's, do you remember another family like that we looked at a, few, a couple months back? We started. Yes, the Hasmoneans was the clan but the big family in it was the Maccabees. So if you're really talking about like um, Mattathias would be Mattathias Maccabeus uh, Hasmonea with a hyphen in between there. I hope that makes a little sense to you. In this book, there are four main sections. You could go to just one and read it and learn a whole lot of stuff and chuck the rest of it. To me, the very first chapter, and you'd say, well, look there. See, he's Jewish, so the Jewishness of him is coming out. The big, big section is called the Jewish War. That's what he caught. He's a historian. He's looking back. The Maccabees are gone. But he's lived through, he's, his parents have lived through it, and he's a historian. He researches. And so he gives history of the Jewish War in there. There's another section on Jewish antiquities, their customs and their histories. How did the Jews really live? Little oddball things, trivia things, things very much of interest. There's a whole section on that. <coughs> he has a philosophical section, and this is where the Greek comes in, in him, called Vita. Vita means life. And it's philosophies of life and, and just a lot, of, a lot of the Greek is there. And you can pick up on the Greek culture and their philosophies and their beliefs. The last one is this, that tells you and shows how, how strong, really Jewish he was. It's called Against Appian. He actually has a whole section of this book that he just doesn't like, a guy named Appian, because he was a Hellenized Egyptian. He was a friend. Keep in mind, where is the... Where is the incredible sum total of all cultures and writings and books at this point still? Alexandria. Where's Alexandria? Egypt. And he had a friend there. Remember, he's writing. Josephus is writing. His writings are going to be thinking, well, they've got to go down into Alexandria eventually. I don't know that they didn't. But here was a guy that was his friend and he just, when he just adopted the Greek culture, which was total perversion and anti-God, and he walked away from his Jewish culture. And that upset Josephus in some way. It really did. It just sent him reeling. So much so they did a whole section on this guy and what's wrong with him. <laughs> <coughs> Keep in mind, Josephus could be very vengeful uh, because what was he first of all in our list? the general of the northern armies. He knows what it is to be a CEO, a boss. 
in the section under the Jewish wars, it's very heavy on the Hasmoneans. It has Herod the Great and his family in there. Wow. It has the Roman emperors. Caesar, Augustus, and Tiberius were alive when Jesus was born. Who gave the edict that all the world should be taxed and everybody go back to their homes? Okay, Augustus, Caesar Augustus, Tiberius was alive when Jesus was crucified. But had nothing, probably didn't even hear about it. Then there's Gaius, also known as Caligula. Most people know Caligula. Terrible persecutor of Christians. Terrible. Him and Nero and Claudius were all rats. And persecutors of the way. God's people. In it also are the Roman prefects and procurators. You read about in the, in the Jewish wars, you'll read about Pontius Pilate. We find him in the Gospels. You'll find about Felix. Paul met him. And Festus, Paul met him in Acts 23, 24, 25. But it's not scripture. He's not copying scripture. He's lived these guys. These guys are still alive. And he's writing history. Stuff that we can find and we can read and enjoy. Several other areas of con co uh, contribution in there, and there are sections. <coughs> Listen to this. Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Sanhedrin, John the Baptist, Jesus is mentioned. James, the pastor of the first church, the high priest is mentioned. Wow. There are two parallel incidents from Josephus in the New Testament that sort of line up. John the Baptist and things that he did, and Jesus before Pilate. Now think about this. Jesus is before Pilate at 30 A.D. roughly. Okay, he died crucified around 30 A.D. Josephus was born roughly, what, 37, wasn't it? So... He's in his teenage years, and he's not, 20, he's not 20 years from Christ. How far is 9-11 from us? We're 18 years. We're almost 20 years from 9-11. Can you believe that? How, how would you do writing history on that? You'd know a lot, wouldn't you? You'd tell about your experience. Okay, well, Josephus, as a teenager, would be told what happened and to have his parents around. He had eyewitnesses to all of this. And so he wrote about it, but he was writing history. He was not writing scripture. I end the book section because next week we will be doing religion and politics, and you have it titled something else. And this is the best section, I think, coming up yet, and yet it's the shortest. I think it's a dynamic that it will just clear and put everything in order to you and to me about what, what just ties in from where we left off in Malachi, what happened in those 400 years, and what Jesus had to live with and had to walk with. Because that's what we're going to be dealing with. I brought this up here very simply, and I've ended with this. John 21, verse 25. He ends his gospel, the, the, great, the great disciple and apostle John. Are there, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose not even the world itself could, could, could contain the books that would be written. John knew about the library at Alexandria. John knew about that. It was there. He never visited it. But when he was talking about, he had knowledge that every book in the world was trying to be put and contained in that book. And yet, look what he ends the book, he ends the life of Christ's gospel, and I say amen. We can't even start to imagine the power, the earth that Jesus walked on. That as he treaded, that his miracles, we don't know the people. When he said, when he, many times, he'd go into a town and he'd leave and everybody had been healed. Every one of those is a life story. Every one of those people would be a book of what he did in the touch of the master's hand. And John says, the books of the world, the books of, life, of Alexandria, these books of the Apocrypha and all this other garbage stuff that was written, and the history and Josephus and all this cool stuff that's around, the Dead Sea Scrolls, had, had anybody just sat down, no one could write everything that, about the life of Jesus. It's just incredible. We're going to see him 
him, and that's how we'll end this entire study with, we cannot end the intertestament period without Jesus Christ. We can't because it was all built up to him. I went over today and I'm not borrowing time and I'm not paying it back next week. <laughs> this is just too good. I'm selfish. Usually I give you the minutes back and let you out of here. Please do not miss next week. It will be powerful. It will be strong. I can, amen. And, 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 and Charlene? This table didn't get a prayer sheet. Do you have any, hon? If you don't leave, she'll get to you while, while I pray. Right here, Charlene's table. Let's pray together. Father, you are so good to us and wonderful. Thank you for this study. I've learned an awful lot. It's been really challenging and a blessing. And, Lord, you answered prayer because one of the things I set out to do is I needed to see Christ in the hand of God through years that we didn't have true scripture. But you, are, you were there as you are right now. Lord, make today alive in our lives and our hearts. May Jesus shine. May the word of God have preeminence in the spirit of God. And Lord, I pray next week's lesson as we sort of wrap things up, I pray it would be powerful and bless us and challenge us. Oh, thank you for it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.